Thank you, Nate. Um, this is a very interesting setup up here. I, uh, you guys can see me very well, thanks to these lights, but I um, have a very difficult time seeing you. So I feel like I'm talking out into the, to the void a bit. But uh, nonetheless, I'm looking forward um, to talking and spending more time with you guys for the rest of the day. It's been great so far, this conference. Teaching sovereign knowers. Teaching is a rather odd sort of activity. It's dependent not only on what the teacher does, but also on the agency of the student. A bricklayer can build a wall without the agency of the bricks, but teaching is different. When I first came to the Heights, there was an older gentleman named Bob Tobin who was teaching history and government. He was a part-time teacher and a semi-retired lawyer. He once had a conversation with a judge who proceeded to tell him that teaching was done all wrong today and that if he, the judge, was teaching, he would do it right. Bob went back and related this to his class, and one of the students replied, Mr. Tobin, tell him to come to try to teach our class. We'll show him he can't teach us anything. <laughs> so there is a real sense in which a student has to learn for himself. A teacher may be able to go through a process that forces the student to cram information into a short-term memory and then unload it on a quiz, only to quickly forget it. But this is not really education. Real learning is only accomplished by engaging the freedom of the student. In question 117 of the first part of the Summa, St. Thomas Aquinas asked the question, whether one man can teach another. He gives a qualified answer of yes and notes that the work of a teacher is analogous to the work of a doctor in that a good doctor does what is necessary for the body of the patient to heal itself according to its own natural principles. A good teacher basically does two things. He removes obstacles to student learning and proposes the truth to the student in an attractive way. In this talk, I plan to describe some obstacles to student learning, including obstacles common to all people and times and obstacles specific to our current cultural moment. Then in the second part of the talk, I hope to offer some perspective on the qualities a teacher needs to be able to remove these obstacles and teach in an engaging, an attractive way. The first obstacle is that learning is hard work. Correspondingly, there is a bit of understandable laziness that needs to be overcome. We all know from experience that attentive listening and active study are difficult. Here at the Heights, the juniors and seniors have their annual flag football tournament the Tuesday before Thanksgiving break. This year, the weather forecast was miserable. It was calling for 40s and steady rain. Faced with the prospect of postponing the tournament and having classes instead, the seniors signed a near unanimous petition to proceed despite the weather. <laughs> Our only condition was that they needed to agree not to complain about being cold and wet, which they readily assented to. Similarly, many years ago, when we were a smaller school, we used to have periodic work days where students from a particular grade would do hard manual labor under the watchful eye of Mr. Burns for the betterment of our campus, all instead of sitting in on classes. The boys saw this as a real treat and would be terribly disappointed if such a day were canceled because of rain. Though ultimately fulfilling, Learning is difficult, and most boys would welcome a break of enduring physical hardships as an alternative to the strenuous work of attending classes. The second obstacle is that our students are distracted by interior complications. On any given day, it may be quite difficult for a particular teenager to be present to his math or history lesson. 
the interior spaces of young people today are impacted by social challenges and emotional problems. A teacher may be waxing eloquently about the Industrial Revolution while all a particular student hears is the droning of the teacher from Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. Students can be very effective in relegating the voice of a teacher to background noise, sometimes even pleasant background noise. A veteran Heights theology teacher, who's also a father and is known for going on long tangents in class, once related to me that his grown son, who is a priest, called him to ask for advice on a homily he was preparing. The teacher started talking and went on uninterrupted for some time, only to find out that his priest son was not really listening. His son admitted, Dad, I, I wasn't really paying attention to what you said. I called you because I find that the background noise of you talking helps me think. <laughs> I made good progress on my homily, thank you. <laughs> the social and emotional complications that young people carry with them, including into the classroom, are unfortunately all too real. What goes on in the mind of many children today as a teacher talks at times reflects real troubles. Even before COVID, this generation of students was in the midst of a mental health crisis. There's been lots written about the increasing anxiety and passivity of young people today. The sociological data shows these trends accelerating starting around the time the iPhone became popular. A good book that summarizes this data is called iGen, which I think some of you have probably read. It goes into granular data, such as the decline in teens getting driver's licenses and jobs, and how they tend to spend much more time at home. It's been my experience that students today are more anxious and more passive than when I began teaching in the 1990s. The passivity and anxiety of students today is not just a consequence of poor mental health. There are deeper cultural reasons related to an arc of intellectual history going back centuries. The title of this talk, Teaching Sovereign Knowers, comes from an essay by Walker Percy called The Loss of the Creature. Percy uses the phrase sovereign knowers in reference to the challenge most people today face in knowing and relating to the world around them. The word sovereign brings to mind images of a king a sovereign lord, exercising governance over his lands. Percy uses this phrase to refer to a person who has governance over how he stands before reality, knowing in a way that takes ownership of the knowing as one who has full possession of his reason, exercising it in the present moment. A sovereign knower is engaged and self-directed committed to seeking to know truth for himself. Percy's essay is fascinating because while not denying that there is a moral dimension to the contemporary problem of sovereignty or agency, he argues that the problem is deeper. It is not simply the vice of intemperance causing a lack of self-governance or self-control. It's not simply that teenagers are addicted to their phones spending hours scrolling through social media. The problem has an intellectual dimension, a dimension related to how people living in this current cultural moment stand before reality. It is a problem that goes back at least as far as Descartes, who represents the shift inward as the starting point for our intellectual gaze. I think, therefore I am, reflects the shift from primarily standing with eyes open to the world around us to directing one's focus inward, to one's own thoughts, to the self as a thinking subject. Percy's approach is to lead the reader through a series of thought experiments. He begins by reflecting on the experience of the first European to discover the Grand Canyon, Garcia Lopez de Cardenas, who apparently is a relative, a distant relative of our own Joe Cardenas. 
Cardenas's unexpected encounter with the Grand Canyon, the amazing sight he beheld as he traversed one more mound on a repetitive semi-arid landscape is contrasted with the experience of the tourists who travel by bus to Bright Angel Lodge and view the canyon behind the structure set up by the Park Service. Percy notes that Cardenas's unexpected encounter with the Grand Canyon had a magnificence that, despite the good intentions of the Park Service, is actually threatened by the structures they put in place. Percy argues that these very structures make it nearly impossible for today's tourist to actually see the Grand Canyon as it really is, as Cardenas saw it. In Percy's analysis, if Cardenas's experience of seeing had a value of, say, P, then the value of the millions who see it today behind the symbolic machinery established by the Park Service is closer to a millionth of P than P. Percy gives some interesting examples of creative ways one could bypass the Park Service structures to again see the canyon, such as intentionally heading off the beaten path to approach the canyon in an unconventional way. Percy is concerned with how people have become reduced to consumers of information packaged by others, often others who have a recognized expertise or authority. It is very difficult for people to know the creature, by which Percy means basically any real thing, in the context of its defined symbolic machinery. Part of the problem is that we have been conditioned to value theory, abstract ideas, over the concrete being of the creature, so that the creature is known primarily as a specimen of a type. Percy's reflections remind me of Pope Benedict's Regensburg Address, which is more about the modern crisis of reason than it is about faith and reason. Benedict notes that our society suffers from the reduction of the scope of human reason to only being able to objectively know through the methods of the empirical sciences, the error of scientism. Benedict traces the historical roots of the crisis through stages of dehellenization, turning away from the Greek ideal of a complete use of our reason throughout modern thought. We intuitively grasp the scope of the problem when we consider how quickly people today tend to defer to others, whether experts, data scientists, or even cultural narratives to help make sense of experience. If truth is rightly defined as the correspondence between the mind and reality, today this correspondence has been made difficult by structures and patterns of thought that insulate the mind from actually encountering the real, the creature, as a sovereign knower. People distrust their ability to know reality as sovereign free agents. Instead, there is a willing surrender to an outside source to validate one's thinking and experience. This is why many students are comfortable being shuffled along from class to class, performing tasks, but not really taking ownership of their education not embarking on a quest to know reality. And most people are not even aware of this problem. They do not realize that this has happened. Percy does provide a few thoughts on what an education would look like that addresses the problem of sovereignty or agency. He mostly advocates impractical solutions, a type of shock therapy to help students, again, become able to freely see the creature or subject before them. For example, Percy wonders if a student who goes into a science lab intending to do a dissection, but instead finds a Shakespearean sonnet, will be able to encounter the sonnet in an authentic way, removed from the obscuraging packaging of the English class, the literary experience textbook, the smell of the textbook's pages, the smell of Miss Hawkins, Percy is not really trying to propose specific reforms to our educational system. He is more trying to make the reader aware of the intellectual side of the problem of sovereignty or agency so as to encourage him to fight the rescue, to rescue the creature 
from whatever symbolic machinery obscures it. For example, Percy does not suggest that we get rid of museums, but rather that anyone who goes into a museum should know that he has a fight on his hands to try to rescue the creature, what he is looking at, from the packaging. The struggle we have to bypass the symbolic machinery to get to the creature is not a feature of human nature. It is a particularly modern problem that has an identifiable history. It is a function of our current cultural moment. It has come about in part because fundamental insights behind Western civilization have been turned upside down. At the root of Western civilization is the conviction that knowing truth is liberating. The ancient Greeks saw contemplating the way the world is, contemplating reality, as fulfilling a desire for transcendence written in the human heart. Life may seem monotonous, a never-ending cycle of birth, hardships, and death, but the human mind can grasp unchanging truth, and this knowing was seen as presenting the possibility of transcendent meaning, as leading to human fulfillment and freedom. Sure, knowing truth could involve hard work, and I'm sure some people in ancient Greece found it difficult to listen to Aristotle lecture. But even so, there was a confidence in human reason and an excitement about the possibility of knowing reality. Things became more complicated by the paradigm shift Descartes represents. Modern thought involves a change from man standing before the world in awe with his gaze primarily directed outward, toward instead looking to the inner self as a new point of departure. This inner psychological self was idealized by Rousseau in the Romantic movement in the early 19th century. Indeed, Rousseau posited that the inner world, what we can call one's subjectivity, is what is authentic about a person and what is threatened by society. Rousseau rejects the notion that man is marred by original sin, that he needs a redeemer to become truly himself. Instead, man longs for the freedom to realize himself according to his inner natural intuitions, which according to Rousseau are always pure, noble, and good. The romantic movement that followed seems on the surface to be a renewed appreciation of nature, which to some extent it is, although it is better understood as seeing meaning in nature according to this newly discovered inner subjectivity. Though the intellectual elites up through the Romantic period had departed from the Greek notion that meaning is to be found in knowing objective reality, in knowing truth, the notion of nature had not yet been abandoned. For Rousseau and the Romantics, it was still possible to talk about human flourishing according to what it means to be human. There were still a few steps to go to reach modern expressive individualism, the idea that being authentic by acting out of one's unique inner core of feelings and intuitions is what matters, the dominant ideology of our time. To be an authentic person now means acting outwardly, performing really, according to one's unique inner intuitions and feelings. Marx, Nietzsche, and others paved the way for this final step. For Marx, there is no such thing as a stable human nature. Instead, all human values, culture, art, the way we understand reality, and every way we associate with others are political superstructures built upon the underlying substructure of economics. Liberation is to be found in the advance of history to the point where economic substructures no longer lead to oppression and alienation. Nishi goes further still by positing that human fulfillment can only be found by the artist who creates his own meaning, who creates himself. Bishop Robert Barron has some excellent reflections on how these and other thinkers have contributed to our current cultural moment. Another great place to go to learn more about this is Carl Truman's work. Truman wrote a tome called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. 
His friend, Ryan Anderson, reached out to him to compliment him on his work, but also to encourage him to write a shorter and more accessible version, which Truman did in Strange New World, which Height seniors read as part of their History of Western Thought class. This brings us to the second part of this talk, teaching in a way that leads students to become sovereign knowers, teaching in a way that helps students overcome obstacles to learning, both the ordinary challenges associated with the hard work of learning and the challenges particular to today. Especially when supported by a mission-aligned school, someone with a vocation to teach can help students overcome all obstacles and propose the truth to his students in an attractive way. There's only time to scratch the surface of this topic, but more will be coming out soon on the Heights Forum as we publish sections of a substantial manuscript also titled Teaching Sovereign Knowers. First, the vocation to teach is the vocation to be a contemplative of a certain sort. To contemplate is to look with a loving gaze, a gaze that is not blind to problems and faults, but is primarily directed to the good and loves the good that is there and could be there, the yet unrealized good, in spite of everything. Someone with a vocation to teach must contemplate not only his subject, our current cultural moment, and truth in general, but also his students. G.K. Chesterton famously said that Rome was not loved because she was great, but that Rome became great because she was loved. The same is true of a teacher. He does not love his students because they are perfect, but rather loves them in their imperfection, and this love helps them to be better. The best parents, likewise, while certainly not blind to the faults of their children, lovingly look at them, in a sense, as better than they are, keeping in mind the person that each can become. This loving contemplation is deeply Christian, pointing beyond our duty to avoid rash judgments and toward the charity of seeing others in the best possible light, even to make excuses for what we cannot simply overlook. Think of Moses' sons covering their father's nakedness. Contemplating one's students means looking at them with a loving gaze that rests more on their virtues than their faults. Faults and obstacles to learning are seen as temporary and not overly important. When someone with a vocation to teach looks at his students, he primarily sees the saints they are called to become and can become. A teacher must have an unshakable conviction that all people have been created to know and love truth that doing so leads to human flourishing. There is a teleology, an end directedness built into human nature. St. Augustine was reflecting on this anthropological truth when he wrote, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Those who assert that human fulfillment is reached by expressing outwardly performing according to one's inner core of intuitions, so-called modern expressive individualism, are wrong. The human heart is made to know and love truth, ultimately to know and love God himself. And no matter who you are, nothing less than this will do. It is not about a personal choice to be defined in a certain way. We have been made a certain way. We have transcendence built into who we are as human beings, and even the most confused person will only be happy when he comes to know his creator. A teacher contemplates his students and all of this so as to be able to act and to act decisively. He acts to overcome obstacles and establish the conditions for a student to freely enter into the learning process. This is not easy and requires lots of experience to get right. One of the most important things a young teacher can do, in addition to reflecting on how things are going, what seems to work and what does not, is to seek out mentoring from an experienced teacher, 
especially as he learns how to interact with a class as a whole in addition to each individual student. Mentoring can help him strike the right balance so that the class is neither too passive or sleepy nor too rambunctious. All of this takes time. With regards to teaching sovereign knowers to awakening agency, the specific focus of this talk, I want to suggest one simple principle all teachers should strive to follow. The teacher should treat each student as a free rational agent, or even better, should help each student to engage his freedom as a rational agent who can stand before reality, considering what the tradition and the teacher proposes. And the teacher should do this regardless of whether the student wants to be treated as a free rational agent or not. The teacher is a coach and guide who proposes a vision of reality, an understanding based on a long tradition of people considering what it means to be human and what leads to our flourishing. The best teachers become masters at removing obstacles to students pondering truth for themselves, but never removing their students' freedom to accept or reject what is proposed to them. How does a teacher do this? I have a few practical suggestions. Again, there's gonna be much more on this coming out on the forum. First, the teacher should take a narrative approach. He should tell stories. This is true in all subjects, not just literature and history. One of the best ways to engage a person's freedom is to present a narrative context where the person is invited to consider things from a context of meaning, where a person can imagine himself interacting with a broader paradigm. This can even happen in teaching math. I have found that students are very interested when I tell stories about the history of math. They are fascinated to learn that in addition to the quadratic formula, there is a cubic formula that was discovered in Italy in the 1500s, but kept secret by professors who used it to engage in math duels for university posts. They are intrigued by the possibility of considering infinite sets that can be understood as equivalent to a specific value, and how this reasoning relates to a dramatic retelling of Zeno's paradoxes against the possibility of motion. The quest for understanding the number pi, the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter, is fascinating, from the discovery that transcendental irrational numbers exist, all the way up to recent efforts to use computers to expand pi to a ridiculous number of digits. When I need to bring the class to a focused point where students come out of themselves and are really present to the possibility of learning, I sometimes use stories to make analogies that have nothing to do with math per se. I was recently teaching about asymptotes of rational functions by comparing the polynomials in the numerator and the denominator to characters in the Marvel Universe. If the denominator is like Thor and the numerator is only like Hawkeye, then the denominator is going to win. If telling, students invite, if telling stories invites students to ponder a subject, a teacher also needs to know when to be silent so as to give the students the space they need to think. A teacher should foster times of strenuous silence that allow students the chance to think for themselves and he should listen when students speak. Seminars where students are expected to talk and graded based on their contributions can be helpful, as well as in-class debates. A teacher could write an interesting assertion on the board and call for five minutes of silence for each student to think of the three strongest reasons, pro and con, the claim, all in preparation for a more fruitful class discussion. All of this models a need to engage material with one's own reason. A teacher's contemplation of his subject and his students as free rational agents built for truth needs to inform the way he governs expectations in his class. Everything is received according to the mode of the receiver. A teacher can manage his class 
in such a way that a student is reduced to a memorizing and forgetting machine. I once heard a student in the hallway exclaim to his friend, relief, that he can now forget all that stuff he just unloaded on the test. It was as if he had forced content into his head and was in a state of tension until he could allow himself to forget it. This is not good. Teachers should expect that students have precise knowledge, that they memorize definitions, dates, and facts, but not in a way that encourages the cram, unload, and forget cycle. Rather than have a predictable weekly vocabulary quiz, for example, on a new set of vocabulary words each time, it could be better to uh, include old vocabulary words on each quiz, each weekly quiz, and also to look for ways to draw vocabulary from literature, history, or science texts that are read, even if it means covering less words overall. Tests and quizzes are important, but need to be designed to reinforce long-term learning and thinking rather than unloading information to be quickly forgotten. A teacher needs to carefully consider how he can lead his students to profoundly encounter a text. A worksheet reading guide that students fill out while reading, excuse me, Sorry about that. A worksheet reading guide that the students fill out while reading may be helpful for some parts of some texts, but it also could be an excuse for a student to not read, say, Dickens's Tale of Two Cities, and instead hunt through the text looking for answers to questions on the sheet. A student following a reading guide worksheet may experience the need to read a few lines of Dickens as an unwelcome interruption to the scanning exercise that the worksheet is fostering. In Percy's terms, this is like a teacher actively building additional symbolic machinery to obstruct the view of the Grand Canyon. This can be a real problem, even in the classical liberal arts education movement. A quick browsing through a catalog of resources reveals study guides to great works from the tradition that sometimes do little else than reduce students to scanners of text so as to fill out answers. To the extent possible, teachers should limit the use of textbooks. Instead, doing things like using primary source documents. Students who read and discuss the significance of George Washington's farewell address are being treated as rational agents capable of evaluating a rich document for themselves. A typical history textbook is a conglomeration of facts, opinions, and even ideologies that are being packaged as the Bible truth, as the objective representation of the subject for which the student must submit. In science classes, the problem is just as bad. A typical science textbook presents the theory as that which is real and that which we can use to interpret reality, which should conform to this theory. This is exactly the opposite of what modern science really is. The scientific method begins with observations of the real world and proceeds to form models that have explanatory and predictive power, but also limitations, models that can be improved Students who study from a typical science textbook end up getting the impression that the theory is what is real and that we cannot know the world apart from the theory. It would be much better to start with the real world or cover the history of how scientists developed their models and discovered their models' limitations. The teachers we need today must develop a habit of continually reflecting upon how their students are being led to become fully free rational agents, or if there are classroom policies that are leading away from this noble goal. How are students receiving and responding to what the teacher does and what he proposes to them? A teacher should have confidence that by proposing the truth to the students, 
not only the limited truth of his specific subject, but the truth about reality and God, he is presenting the path to human flourishing. The goal should be forming sovereign knowers who can reflectively engage with the problems of our times, standing up to the structures of power and domination with a voice of reason. Occasionally, we educators catch a glimpse of what success looks like, as I did last spring. We have a tradition of inviting guest speakers to address upper school students during lunch. Students bring their lunches to our oversized classroom on the third floor to eat and listen. Over the years, we have had speakers ranging from members of SEAL Team 6 to successful Heights alumni businessmen. Last year, around 50 students were seated to listen to the gentleman in charge of content moderation for Facebook, who happens to be a friend of Mark Granis, who teaches philosophy and history here in the upper school. One class Mark teaches is called History 327, Free Speech and Civic Virtue. Mark's friend did an excellent job of framing the discussion from both a legal and ethical perspective. There was general agreement that some public speech should be restricted, even beyond the obvious example of yelling fire in a crowded theater, and that free speech is also important. Then the discussion became interesting. A Heights senior asked a probing question about what happens when ethical paradigms conflict and how this relates to religious freedom. Mark's friend definitely came down on the side of the platform's right to ban speech that is, criti that is critical of identifiable groups who consider their group identities threatened by such criticism. He saw a restricting language that runs afoul of modern expressive individualism as a matter of justice, even when this policy seems to be at odds with the ethical and religious convictions of many. He noted that religious arguments were once raised in support of slavery. Then, in line with critical theory, he mentioned that those in speech moderation need to discern who has been oppressed by particular cultural notions so as to take this into account in making decisions. The entire discussion was civil and rational. There was a considerable amount of back and forth and several students raised good points, such as noting that what is really going on is a clash between differing ethical paradigms rooted in differing fundamental beliefs. Who is capable of arbitrating between such different ethical viewpoints? The final point was made by a Heights junior who started by granting, for the sake of argument, that Mark's friend and others at Facebook may be correct over 95% of the time in silencing particular voices. But isn't there a danger that you might just silence a voice that has something crucial for our society, a voice that has part of the solution that we all need to go forward? Hasn't this happened in the past when a voice that challenged the mainstream had truth that mattered for the entire community? Isn't this power to ban speech dangerous? It was encouraging to me to see our students on their way to being sovereign knowers, to see that it is possible even today to form students capable of seeing what is behind such euphemistic phrases as content moderation and supporting chosen identities so as to ask the right probing questions. Thank you.